If you would, if you're able to, would you rise to your feet as we read the word of the Lord? Psalms 101. I will sing of your love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will walk in my house with blameless heart. I will set before my eyes no vile thing. The deeds of faithless men I hate, they will not cling to me. Men of perverse hearts shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor in secret, him I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may deal with me, and he whose walk is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. For every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, we've been reading through the scriptures, and I'm hoping you're keeping up. And if you haven't, don't be discouraged. Just get started. Either catch up or pick up where we're at, but read the Bible for yourself because it is so important. Because the Bible contains everything that you need to know about who you are, about how it is that you're supposed to exist, everything that you need to know about God, and everything that you need to know about salvation, the fullness of it, and how to apply that in your very life. There's everything you need to know about, well, how to be a Christian. And I think that that's a fair question. What should the Christian look like? Have you ever considered that? What it is that the Christian should look like? Now, if I were to ask you this, and I were to say to the regular person, hey, what should the Christian look like? We'd probably use words like, well, love, forgiveness, charity, Jesus, right? Because Jesus is always the answer. And, and yes, yes, these things are true, but to be fair, those are pretty vague terms, right? I mean, what does it mean to say it should look like Jesus, or it should look like love, or it should look like forgiveness? But these are the terms that we use because for whatever reason, we use a lot of vague terms in everything that we say. We're a very vague kind of society anymore. We just use cliches and words to sound good, and then anything that we can reduce into a, into a meme, and we just kind of assume that that's going to cover everything. And while we may understand what we mean when we say it, we can't assume that others do. And unfortunately, a lot of times when we speak very vaguely, we start to believe very vaguely. And we start to act very vaguely. And instead of acting with precision in all our aspects of life, we kind of just shock and approach everything. And I think we've all been there. In fact, most of us are probably there most of the time, where everything is just a shock and approach. I'm just going to kind of throw off this I need there, I need this there, instead of just being precise about who we are. And who we are as a Christian is matter. In fact, it matters so much that I just... I really want this. That's why I want us to read the Bible. I want you to know who it is you were created to be. Because it isn't just about myself or going to heaven. But it has so many other implications. You see, who you are as a Christian absolutely matters. It is a big... It's a big implication into this world. When I was a kid, I remember, uh, you know, my mom was the single mom, so my, you know, she showed us off to VBS because it makes for great summer day camp. And so we go off into the VBS, and that was really my first exposure to kind of uh, Protestant Christianity. And I would go into there, and we'd go into the daycare, the, or the daycare, the VBS, which was really all it was at this time. And they would tell us, oh, they try to teach us about Jesus, right? Because every VBS does this, and that's great, it's wonderful, and they should. But they talk about, oh, you need Jesus, and Jesus will get you to heaven. And if you just say this prayer, then when you die, you're going to go to heaven, and you're not going to go to hell because bad people go to hell, and Jesus doesn't want you to do that. And I thought, okay, well, that makes sense to me because I don't want to go to hell. I mean, I'm only seven years old, but I understand that that's a bad place to go. I want to go to the heaven place, whatever that is. I want to go to the better place. And I would go home at the end of the day and I would do this and I would realize that all the stuff that they had taught us at EBS was really wonderful for when I died, but I would come home to my alcoholic father, to my manic depressed mother, to my poverty life, and I realized that Christianity had no practical place in my real world. 
And that's the reality that for a lot of people, we look at Christianity and say, hey, that's all hunky-dory for when I die, but right now I have bills, right now I have problems, right now it has no practical implication in this world. And the reason we feel this way, the reason people see this this way, is because to be fair, Christians don't act like the Christians of the Bible. We act like the Christians of some gospel said, I said a prayer, I accepted Jesus, and now I'm saved and going to heaven. And that's not what we're taught to do. That's not what we're supposed to be. In fact, that projects the wrong image. So what should the Christian look like? Here, here's a quick clue. If you go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter, he writes, but you, and this is talking to Christians, but you, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priest, you're a holy nation, you're a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. So what he's telling the Christians is, look, you're trying to figure out who you are, let me tell you who you are in short. And he points back to the Old Testament, to what God tells the Hebrews. He says, you're a royal priest, you're a holy nation. Every believer, Peter says, every Christian, every person who calls themselves saved by God is called to become this royal priesthood, to reach out to others, to, to be this holy nation, to become the people of God. And then this royal priesthood, even in and of itself, what does that look like? It's, it's, it's Honestly, it's this marriage between the way we worship God and the way we act as stewards of his world, that we are this royal priesthood. That we, like David, because of royalty, were placed in a position of authority. We're placed in a position of responsibility for others. David's a king. He has a responsibility over his nation. You, as the people of God, have a responsibility over creation. The way you have a responsibility over your children, over those around you, you have a real responsibility. And, and along with that, we're placed in a position where we're to worship God and to share this message with the world so that they can realize that their rightful place is before this God who loves them so that they too can be good stewards of all the things in this world. It always boils down to that. Every message you find in the Bible is about being in a right relationship with God so that you can reflect that back into creation to all these things that God is doing. It's about serving others and sharing God's word. It seems pretty vague, Pastor. It is. But it is what it is. We are to serve others and to share God's words. I love this. Um, N.T. Wright, one of my favorite theologians, he says, Worship and mission are conjoined twins. They share a heart, a heart that loves God, the triune creator, and that loves, for his sake, the world he made, and particularly the creatures that bear his, his image. In other words, when we worship God, whatever we do, we cannot separate that from the mission which is to reach other people for Christ. But it's so much more than just saying, we need you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior so you don't go to hell. The gospel message is about sharing this message of truth, of hope, of all these things that Christ does. We are responsible to do this. And the reason we are told to do this is because the reality is that we, how we exist as Christians, matters to the entire world. Do you understand that? What you do matters. It makes a difference, not just to you, but to everybody in this world, what I do matters to my children, absolutely certainly. But even more than that, what I do matters to everybody around this world. Because what I do to my children is going to affect others, it's going to affect this, it's going to affect that. How I treat the person on the street, how I'm seen just, just in the sidelines when people look at me and I don't even know they're looking. Everything that you do matters to this world. And if everything that you do matters to this world, then the reality is that everything that you do either benefits this world or it slips it further into chaos. There is no in-between. And I know that's a scary place to be, but that's the reality. And nobody's exempt from this. And so we have to find ourselves asking, how should I live? What should I look like? This is why holiness matters. This is why it matters what we do. This is why it matters that we read this and know what's in here. Now David was the king. He was a great king. And he realized this when he wrote this song. And in this song, he shares some of the most basic principles of what it means to be a people of God, what it means to be Christians. So what should the Christian look like? Well, let's look at what David says here. David says, first off, I will sing of your love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praise. Now, what does it mean to sing of love and justice? I mean, if I'm walking down the street and some, some cat's walking towards me, and I see this dude just all singing this happy-go-lucky song, I can assume this guy's having a good day, right? If I walk, see somebody walking by with their head down and they're, they're whistling the blues, I don't know if people actually whistle the blues anymore, but I can be right. You know, the way people sing tells a lot about where they're at. David's not talking just about, I'm singing a song. What he's saying is that in everything that I do, I'm going to project to others that they know, that they know about your love, about your justice. 
I'm the king. People are watching me. They see me. They, they know what it is that you believe. They know what it is that you're proclaiming. And so he says, I'm going to sing of your love, God. I'm going to sing of your justice. When the people look at me, when I judge others, when I make decisions, when I make laws, whatever it is that I do, I want it to, to be a song of your love, a song of your justice. I want to convey that to the other people, to the rest of this world to which I'm responsible. And this is something that most Christians, I think, would agree with, that we're supposed to convey God's love and justice, right? That we're supposed to convey that into this world. I want to read you some of these passages that, that, that you find in the scriptures about love and justice. Isaiah says in 1, 16 and 17, the prophet Isaiah, God says, Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. This is a pretty cool little message. So what are you supposed to do? Not just take bad things out of your life, because as Christians, we often like to preach that. You need to get rid of this, and get rid of this, and don't do that. And then to be fair, for most of us, Christianity is a big set of rules that we're not allowed to do. It's a lot of do not. I know that's how I felt about Christianity. I'm like, I'm not going to church, because they're going to tell me I can't do that. I can't do that. And sure as heck, I went to the church, and you know they told me, you can't do that. You can't do that. And he says, okay, yes, you're supposed to get rid of sin, which is the whole of the story. But he says, also, seek justice. You're supposed to do something. Seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. In other words, saying, go do things for those who care. It's a great, simple message. And this message, it has not changed over the creation of mankind. Listen, our relationship with God is meant to convey real love and real justice into this world. That's what we're supposed to do. And so David says, these are the things I'm going to sing about, about how to convey this love. And by doing that, I'm going to give you praise, God by doing these things that I consider important. The prophet Hosea says the same thing. Through the prophet Hosea, God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. In other words, you come into the church, he tells the Jews, and you come in saying, oh, look, God, we brought you this great sacrifice, and we're there every day of the week, and, and I sign up for every potluck there is, and I do all the things, and God says, that's not the door, but that's not what I asked for. What I desire was mercy. I mean, mercy. I, I desire an acknowledgement of God, of truth, of reality. The Apostle James, Jesus' brother, says, the religion that our God, our Father, accepts is pure and faultless. It's this, to look out for orphans and widows in their distress, to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. What is it supposed to look like? I know we're being real vague here, but for the most part, it's supposed to look like doing these things for others, about conveying real love and real justice into this world. And to truly praise God, we have to convey this love and this justice into this world. And I know that even that, it's a vague statement, isn't it? What does that look like? Why do you ask? Because David continues in this song. And then let me go through these kind of quickly. In the second verse, David says, I'll be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will walk in my house with a blameless heart. In other words, the Christian is to be careful to lead a blameless life. See, it's not about being perfect, perfected. It's about seeking to be better. Because we're, we fail. I, I get that. We struggle. Man, I, I, I was last night, you know, I was sleeping in a camper in the Walmart parking lot. This is my new home. <laughs> and, and last night, you know, as we started to go in, I seen the Los Banos, um, I don't know what it's called, the Los Banos Local Park Club. <laughs> right, all these all these guys coming in with their cars that they get. Hey, I get it. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with it. They, they want to go and show off their rides. You know, it's a, it's illegal to do some things or whatever. But I'm about it. I'm, I'm not going to yell at them. I'm about to do it. There I am, tired. And then all of a sudden, you realize the Walmart that parking lot turns into a drag strip Friday nights. <laughs> Damn, that car's going right back. <laughs> 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 My camper filled up with smoke, exhaust, and I'm thinking, Lord, please don't let one of them wreck into the camper. I'm going to die here. I don't want to die in a Walmart parking lot. <laughs> and, and, and I found myself, honestly, even getting a little angry, thinking, man, these guys, I hope they get busted. Or I hope they do. And I thought, oh, I don't. I mean, I, I don't want them to be I don't want anyone to break the law. But, but I had to check myself, right? I mean, these are real people doing real things. And, and that's okay. They're, they're just trying to... to to do things. I don't know how else to put it. But I had to check myself and say, don't get so angry, don't get so upset at what these people are doing. 
But we have to be careful to live a blameless life, a life where people look at it and say, hey, this person, this person is trying to be like God. And you don't have to sin. You don't have to do these horrible things that we do. I heard that once, and it kind of shook me. I heard an evangelist once say, you don't actually ever have to sin again. You choose to. I mean, you're right. At the end of the day, we all choose to sin. We do. We make that decision. We create excuses. That's why in Corinthians it says, no temptation has seized you except what's common to man, and God is faithful. He's not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you're tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can stand under it. The, the short of it is this. When David says to live a blameless life, what he's saying is we need to try a little bit to actually do this. Not to say, well, I can't do it, so I'm not going to. To realize that what I do matters. It affects others. If I were to walk out there last night, stop those cars, said, hold up right there. I'm with the church. And you guys are breaking the law. I'm going to call the police. And I'm going to make sure they throw you down. You're not going anywhere. First off, I'm liable to get beat up too in that anyway. Secondly, man, what are these guys going to say? Look at this pastor. Another self-righteous jerk. I would not have been doing anything beneficial to this world. And what I do, even in my off time, when I treat other people, when I talk to them, it matters. It makes a difference. I have to try to live a perfect life because I know that it matters to this world. I don't want my kids to hear me preach up here and roll their eyes because their daddy acts different when he goes home. I want them to believe this. It affects them. I want to grow up and trust this. He says, I will set my eye, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. In other words, the Christian doesn't set vile things before their eyes. Here's, here's one that we struggle with a lot. It's hard in this world today. Now, when I was a kid, pornography was something you had to work for. I mean, I, and I know this sounds kind of, what? Right? You had to go to a store and get a magazine and do stuff. And nowadays, oh my goodness, you literally turn on the internet and it's in your face. It is shoved down your throat. And it is so much so, all these things that we hear, the songs that we hear, the movies that we watch, I mean, TV shows anymore, they're soft porn, they really are, but we don't even care. We become so desensitized to things that it doesn't even bother us anymore because these vile things are in front of us all the time that we're immune to it, it doesn't faze me. I remember being in, in vehicles when my mom was a smoker and all my uncles were smokers and I could get in the car and they rolled up the windows, they didn't crack the window back then. Man, and you right and I was used to the cigarette smoke. I'm like, go somewhere, didn't even think about it. Someone smoking? And, 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 and now it's, 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 it's Trina. Trina has like the super snipper. That person smoked a cigarette six days ago. How, how can you tell? <laughs> right? She, she hasn't been around. I'm desensitized to it. And we don't realize how much this does this to us. That we can see images of people being killed doesn't even bother us anymore. I mean, think about it. When you hear that there's another shooting at the school, when was the last time you heard about a shooting, a mass shooting in a school? They, they happened recently. And when was the last time that brought you to your knees in fear and panic? Anymore, we're like, yeah, another shooting at the school. Well, figures. Because we're desensitized. We don't even care anymore. We're no longer bothered by the death of people. We're desensitized to reality. We, we, it doesn't bother us that people die every day. Because these things come before our eyes. He says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put these vile things before our eyes. Because the real state of our world today should make us realize that placing these vile things before us, it's caused us to become numb to hatred, to evil, and to darkness. I look at politics and it breaks my heart because I keep hearing each side calling the other side evil. I think there's nobody in politics that I see that isn't hateful and evil right now. And that's what we look up to and we, we, we beg, we look forward to, we promote to lead us. We've renamed evil because we place vile things before our eyes. So we have to be intentional. What the Christian needs to do, the Christian needs to be this person that says, I'm not going to look at that anymore. Because I want to hate the smell of cigarette smoke, so to speak. I want it to bother me. I don't want people to say, oh yeah, you've got to be careful with this guy watching you because it bothers him. I want that to be me. I want to see the image of someone dead on the screen and I want it to break my heart. When I hear about a shooting, I want to absolutely have the breath taken from me. And if this world says, well, it's because you're weak, then you know what, so be it. Because I'll be where weak and care about this world as someone who calls himself tough with no empathy whatsoever because empathy is the work of the coward who won't face reality. 
Find place and bow things in front of my face. Instead, Philippians says, finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Man. I'm going to look in my baby's eyes and I'm going to see beauty. I love that. And I want to look in the face of a stranger and see beauty. And I had a homeless guy come this year to the fireworks booth. And he bought some spinners. I mean, he paid with change. And, and I know he wasn't supposed to, so I don't want anyone to be all passionate about love. But I heard him out there liking him. And he came back just so happy. He said, can I get some more? It's not just the beauty of a person. He wasn't some homeless guy. I've seen this guy a million times walking around. Being, oh, my goodness. Come on, guys. Let's take the shopping cart away from this guy. I saw the face of a person who was just having a good time. We don't see that anymore. Because we don't even want to look. It's so easy to hate. But we look to these things because they make a positive impact upon us. And when they make a positive impact upon us, when you start to see people, oh, you will start to make a positive impact in this world. See, what you do matters. <coughs> David says, the deeds of faithless men I hate. They will not cling to me. Men of perverse heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with evil. Listen, the Christian should have nothing to do with the promotion of evil. And don't say, well, it's a better evil than that. I cannot believe that we have become such a cowardice people that we say, I'd rather choose the lesser of two evils. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, choose the lesser of two evils. He says, I'm simply not going to do it. I will have nothing to do with the promotion of evil. Think about it. Think about what is being said by those that you expose yourself to. Do they speak godly words or do they promote evil? Because here's the problem. Evil doesn't walk around with the better saying, hi, I'm evil. It doesn't have that, that thing on it. And we're looking for that. Evil walks around sneaking in. It looks like light. It tries to fit in. It gives excuses why it needs to be there. It justifies itself. Evil is typically hidden in the deepest depths of what it is that we think is good. And the simplicity of the Bible is the most powerful means of bringing life into this world. It, it exposes these things. It says, quite simply, that's evil. It's not right. It shines a light upon it. So we need to be a people who are willing to look for evil, to expose it, and to tell people, listen, that's bad. But what happens? Oh, there he goes again, judging us. Yes, of course I am. Because if you don't judge, you die. Wait a minute, Pastor. The Bible says you're not supposed to judge others. Wow, we really need to work on our, on our vocabulary because the Bible teaches you're not supposed to condemn. But if you don't make judgment, you die. The fact that you are all here means that you make a judgment. You make a judgment about how fast that car is coming down the street before you walk, don't you? I made a judgment last night that I wasn't going to go out in a bunch of about 100 guys with cars and tell them, hey, can you all keep it down? Right? Because my mama raised ugly kids, not stupid ones. That was not going to end well for me. I made a good judgment. We are to judge. We are to make good judgments that encourage. We are not to condemn. We are not to make a judgment that says you deserve death. That's what you're going to get. And so we, we need to make these judgments to look at things and to say, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. If that's evil, I'm calling it out. Because I don't want you to die. And I don't want you to kill anyone on the way. And we need to be a people who call out evil, who call out the lies. Who say, you know what? That's not real. He says, whoever slanders his neighbor in secret, him I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, him I will not endure. The Christian should be the one who protects the integrity of their neighbor by calling out the lies and the deceit. We're, we're a growing community here. And I gotta be honest with you. And, and this is true, I guess, anywhere. But, but I, I just I follow Facebook too much. I keep saying that, but I'm not going to quit because yeah, at least I'm honest about it. But I get bothered by the cynicism that I see in it. Because there's a lot of cynicism. And, and we follow gossip and slander, and I heard this and I heard that, and we love to say that. Instead of trying to protect the integrity of our neighbors, saying that's not true. That's not right. Why would you share that? And anymore, it's hard to do because we live in such a polarized world that if, that if something comes up that's, a, that's it's not true, and we know it's not true, but, but if it's the people that are on our side, then we're not supposed to say anything because that means that we're the enemy. And to be fair, that makes us cowards. That's what that makes you. 
When you're not willing to call out a lie because you're afraid of getting kicked off your team, so to speak, you're a coward. Oh, Pastor, I know I've made a mistake, so I'm sorry. We need to be people who are integrity and say, you know what, I'm going to protect, I'm going to call out a lie every time. I'm going to protect my name. That's the community we need. We need to be looking out for each other. I had a guy come up and he said, man, I moved here from Salinas. He said, I, I love those Palmas. It's a nice, great place to raise a family. He said, I mean, he came up here to, to get rid of it, to get away from the gangs, he said. But he says, man, I watch out for my neighbor. You know, he leaves, goes on vacation. I take out the trash for him. That way it looks like he's gone. You know, like it looks like he's there, I mean, so people don't mess with him. I watch his house and he watches up. And we start looking out for each other. We do. Yeah. And we look out for each other more than we're worried about protecting their integrity. I say, that's not true. Why would you lie about that? I'm not going to share gossip and I'm not going to engage in it. I say, we need to protect the integrity of truth. That's what a Christian looks like. We live in a world of information illiteracy. We need to make sure that we share truth only and that we do diligence to, to share what is truth and not propaganda. And when we tolerate gossip or deceitfulness, we're not living Christ's life. We're contributing to the confusion of the, the, this already confused world. And this world needs clarity, not muddy water. So either you're, you're clearing the waters or you're muddy. We should be a part of clearing the waters. David says, My eyes will be on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. He whose walk is blameless will minister to me. The Christian should always look to those who exemplify Christ. Now this one should make sense to you. You want to be like Jesus, look at Jesus. One day, one day, I want to tell you that I'm going to preach this to you, but I'm not going to. Uh, you probably wish I would. The eight-word sermon. You guys ever heard the eight-word sermon? It's a thing you need to know. See Jesus. See Jesus walk. Walk like Jesus. Right? Make sense? That's it. Simple. We can all go home. Let's do a prayer. And you wish. I, I, wrote, I wrote more, so you all are stuck. Sorry. Sorry. We've got a big finale. Um, look, look, we need to be careful what we're looking to. Uh, let me give you an example of a ridiculous. I got arrested once for DUI. Um, one of the times that I was in jail, I got arrested. I woke up in the morning in jail. And I'm like, oh, that did not end well. And so I'm like, okay, I'm in jail. I don't know what I'm going to do. And of course, you know, you're in jail. If you've ever been there, you realize that it's full of people who are in jail who break the law. That's why I was there. It wasn't a conspiracy. I've told you this before. I was in jail. I remember seeing this guy that, that I knew. And everybody was kind of asking him questions. He's like, yeah, yeah, man. When they got you, that cop can't do that. What you should do is you need to tell you more of this and this. And then tell somebody else. I'm like, oh, this guy's offering free legal advice. <laughs> so I'm like, sweet. So I went up to him. I was like, I'm going to tell you what happened. Because I am a victim here. And he says, oh, yeah, we're all victims, bro. What's up? So I told him, he's like, oh yeah, yeah, dude, that's a trauma, that's this. I was sitting there, in hindsight, I get this, but at the time it seemed reasonable. There I was taking legal advice from a person who had proven abundantly they could not keep the law. <laughs> Just let that sink in for a second. The levels of stupidity on my behalf, okay? This guy has proven to be a failure, and I decided to take legal advice from him. It's like Dave Ramsey always says, don't take financial advice from a broke person. Right? It makes sense. But what do we do? I mean, let's be honest. The, the most advice that we take is, I know, is, is our street advice. No, 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 I talked to this guy. He knows, he knows some stuff. And so he was telling me this and this. I'm like, you ever think about that? We never ask the people who actually know. You want to learn to be like Jesus? Follow Jesus. That's it. Look to him. He is the actual emulation. And follow people who are like Jesus. Don't follow people who say, yeah, man, I was once in the church, but you don't need to do that. You can be all spiritual or wherever you want to be. And I'm like, you're nothing like Jesus because Jesus wasn't spiritual. In fact, Jesus said that the spiritual people missed the point. Jesus was actually quite religious. Jesus believed in religion. He believed in church. He believed in institution. He went out of his way to express this. So let's follow Jesus or people like Jesus. And they're easy to find if you know what to look for. But some of them, they just pop out. There's some people, I know we have saints in this church that you only need to know them for a few seconds. You're like, oh my goodness, you just ooze Jesus. I like that. Look to those people. Find those people. Seek those people. Even Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. We need to look to those who, who, who can mentor us, who can guide us. Those who help us to understand, who are willing to, to let speak into our lives and say, hey, that's not how Jesus would do it. Hey, stop drinking and driving. Turns out that's all I needed to hear. That's how you fix the DUI problem. Don't drink and drive. Christians need to stop taking advice about how to be Christ-like from people who are not Christ-like, from people who are inwardly focused. 
He said, we have been influenced by those who have proven themselves to love God. So who do you seek counsel from? I mean, we're qualified. Verse 7, he says, No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning, I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. In other words, the Christian should seek to end the injustice brought into this world by exposing lies and rebuking them. I'm tired of injustice, and it happens. I mean, I'm sure every one of us has felt it, but there are a lot of injustices in this world. And yes, we are responsible to do something. And so we need to take steps to, to reject evil, to expose lies, and not to tolerate deceit, false accusations, or wickedness. We need to be sincere in the way we love. So our Romans says, love must be sincere, hate what's evil, cling to what's good. That's some really good advice. That should be a bumper sticker, right? Love must be sincere. Hate what's evil, cling to what's good. If you don't take anything from today, don't take that one. Cling to what's good. The Christians should seek to, to end these injustices by doing these things. This is the perpetual cause of the church. It's what we're always to do. You see, your faith in God, yes, it is about this promise of restoration when Jesus comes back and restores all things. Yes, it is about an eternity in God's presence. But Jesus said the kingdom is at hand now. And we're commanded to do these things now. That we are to go out and do everything that we can to try to make this world look as much like heaven as we can when Christ gets here. That's why you exist. That's why every person on this planet exists. There is nobody outside of this group of people. You exist so that you can make this world more like heaven. And you are given every means to do that without excuse. By simply living that life, by simply saying, I'm going to follow these basic tenets of what God calls us to do. I mean, this is Christianity 101. We need to seek justice and truth for this world. To walk blamelessly, to protect our hearts, not to promote evil. That's tolerating. To seek wisdom from those who follow God wisely. To make our daily goal to bring love and justice into this world simply by living lives of holiness. And then this is, is the essence of David's psalm. And it is also the essence of what it means to be Christ-like. Of what it is that, that we're called to do. It's a simplicity to what God commands us. But the implications are not simple. They are huge. And the only way to bring hope, to bring life, to bring peace. We need to be a church. We must church who seek God for more than what benefit we can get from him. We need to be a people who seek God so that he can make us a bigger benefit to this world. In everything that we do. Even, even when we gather on Sunday mornings, why do we gather for church? So that we can posture ourselves in that sense. To realize that that worship is something else that we do on Sunday morning but we come Sunday morning to worship God, to prepare us, so that when we go out as a community, we can worship in there and remember that this church, look around you. This place should be packed. There should be 41,000 people in the church in such bottoms. We have churches that are lacking because not every person in those bottoms has gathered this morning to worship their God. And the reason they haven't gone isn't because we haven't gone door to door to tell them about Jesus. It's because they don't see the purpose. And that's fair. Someone, someone really kind of agitated me this week because I, I invited the community to come to our fireworks to support the church. And the question was, why should we support a church? And you know what? That's fair. That's a fair question. Because from the way that we've done church for the most part, we have no benefit to this world. We have only benefit to its members. We are to be a church that engages. That's why this matters. That's why I keep, I know I'm ranting, I know I'm just dragging on. Oh, I just want us to get this. I love being at this booth because I'm getting to see people. And they don't even know I'm a pastor. When I go out, they see the pastor. They like they put on their pastor talk. I remember that. I was like, Shh, can't smell. They can't smell booze. Don't cuss. We got this. You're good. Don't let them know you're drinking. Hi. <laughs> and 
I love just going up and people talking to me. And then you should see the look on your face when they're like, so where are you? I'm the pastor of the church. <laughs> like, you the pastor? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're one place. <laughs> the, board, the board didn't have a lot of options, apparently. Oh, but I love seeing people. <coughs> See, I want to love every person in this community, I do. But I know the truth. I don't want to love them generically, saying, oh, I love them. Love, love the sooner you the sin. I want to love each person like I love my babies. But I can't do that until I look them in the face and talk to them and get to know their story. And when you do that, when you go out, oh my goodness, you're going to fall in love with people and then you're going to want to just do everything you can for them. And this is how we do it. That's Christianity. So what I want us to do is I want to finish by, by doing a community thing that we do as a church. We gather for the communion, which is quite simply the coming together of God's people at the table of Christ. To say, you know what? This God sits at the table with us and we commune with him and we celebrate but we celebrate and we also mourn with it because it's not completely full. We take in the body and the blood of Christ for ourselves, but we take them in knowing that we want more to be at the table. We want there to be so many people here, and they can because we'll never run out of bread. We'll never run out of wine. There is enough to use for everyone. He wants everyone of the seven half billion people on this planet to take him in, to know him, to have life, and to just grow and to feel the energy and everything that he gives and to do that here and now. So I invite... After we pray, I'm going to invite Pastor Josh to come up, and I'm going to invite you guys to come down, and we're going to invite the ushers.